Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. I'm Don. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 2, Episode 2, entitled Whatever Works. It originally aired on October 4th, 1985. It was directed by John Nicolella, which we have seen a couple times now in The Milk Run and Lombard Street. And he's got a bunch coming up in Season 2. It was written by Maurice Hurley, who wrote Golden Triangle Part 2, plus some teleplays. He's got... Another episode coming up soon. He he's the writer for for the Dutch Oven, which is still my favorite name of an episode. Yes, <laughs> can't wait for that episode. <laughs> the the key thing with John Nicolella is that he was the show's producer, and at the end of season two, he steps away, and Dick Wolf becomes the series producer, and so this show takes a decidedly left turn to the serious and i think we can tell with when john nicolo leaves because you can see in this episode there's actually some comedy behind it yeah you know it had a good little comedy side plot with uh crockett's car throughout the whole episode you know and we got a little bit of izzy moreno too Mm -hmm. uh, which i always enjoy (laughs) before we get started like check in and see what's going on in each other's lives and guys it is the week of christmas we do have a little bit of an announcement to make this upcoming weekend we normally record these shows on sundays and this year it's christmas day on sunday correct it's sunday jesus's birthday is sunday (laughs) you have it on your calendar circle jesus's birthday (laughs) Yeah, I I bought him a gift and everything. (laughs) He's going to love it. It's a pogo stick. (laughs) It's one of those pogo ball things like we had in the 80s where it's just a ball with a disc around it and then you're supposed to like pinch it with your feet. That's a bop it, by the way. (laughs) I don't know. Actually, I don't know. I think it's called a bop it. (laughs) Melissa still has one. Yeah, I do. (laughs) She breaks it out as soon as Dominic goes to work. (laughs) That means we will not be recording an episode this upcoming Sunday on Christmas Day. So next week, in the first week of January, we won't have a new episode for you. So just warning you ahead of time. But with that, we have Christmas coming up. And I believe, you know, we each kind of do Christmas differently. And I'll say in this house, we have a unique scenario now because we have one child who is still Santa Claus and another child who is not Santa Claus. And I hope he's not listening right now. (laughs) Wait, what do you mean? Santa Claus isn't real? I'm so crushed. <laughs> it, I'm returning know, my tree. It's <laughs> funny because you haven't gotten gifts from him in years. So you would think that you would have given up at some point in time. I just thought that was very naughty. <laughs> well, I mean, that is partially true, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, let's go talk about this episode. This was actually a surprisingly good episode. Uh, a little bit of humor, a little bit of seriousness. So let's get over and give our rundown on this episode. All right, so in this opening, we have a there's, there's a lot of information given away right in the beginning. We start off with there's like someone setting up some stuff, almost like party favors, and we learn later it's Santeria stuff, but it, it kind of looks like they're throwing a birthday party in that cop car. <laughs> it, it, it's voodoo, Dominic. It's voodoo. <laughs> there are dolls and pins. <laughs> We see that, and then some time passes like immediately. So it's only like a minute worth of that, and then we jump to the future, and it's Marty talking with Trudy and Tubbs, and it's a cop car that's parked uh, that's parked out there. They're investigating the the cops inside of the cop car have been murdered, and of course, whenever there's a murder, homicide isn't there. Miami <laughs> Vice is there. They do things differently in Miami, okay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> as they're talking, as Trudy and Tubbs are talking with Marty, and so, so far, no sign of Crockett, as they're working the case, another cop car comes driving up, and two cops get out very nervously, quickly walk over to the police car, see that two of their brethren have been killed, and then immediately start asking Trudy and Tubbs and Marty for more information. And Marty does his classic. She just stares at him. He doesn't say anything. He doesn't move. He doesn't do anything. They're begging him for information about their fellow police officers that have been killed and he just sits there and stares at him yeah, yeah and you know marty definitely goes down a very strange road as the episode goes further but i do want to point out that these very angry angry cops in this like murderous rage go and they just stomp off it swear you know basically saying they're gonna go out and kill whoever did this they insinuate the whole time like they clearly know who or what drug dealing gang did this you know and no one stops them they just let them go get in the car and drive off yeah no one asked them like if you know already why don't you tell us who it is because they're like we're not gonna let them get away with this this is like revenge now and all this stuff but they know why don't they say like <laughs> yeah, and, <laughs> and no one ever asked them like hey yeah. so it sounds like you guys have an idea you mind telling us who that is exactly <laughs> <No>. yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, in, instead, Marty just kind of walks off, and, and the uh, two cops just go get in their car and drive off, like, all pissed off. Yeah, and the scene ends with, 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 a, with a great part where Tubbs is like, I think I know what it is, and Marty's like, I know, and Trudy's like, wait, what the fuck? Like, guys, I'm mm-hmm. right here. Why don't you tell me what you think? <laughs> and then eventually Marty goes... Santa Maria, <laughs> and we go to the uh, opening credits. Which I think I I I, I didn't know he said Santa Maria. I was trying to figure out what he said. I was like, was Santa Maria, <laughs> Santa Monica, Santa Claus? Like, like what's he insinuating here? What does that mean? Tell us. <laughs> Don't leave us hanging. When we come back from the opening credits, we go to the dock. Uh, we go to Sunny Slip, where he is um, wearing where short shorts. <laughs> oh, they are the most amazing short shorts. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure those are underwear. I mean, I looked at them pretty closely, and they look like underwear to me. Not that I was complaining, but they were underwear. <laughs> oh, I want to talk about the guy, the guy in the uh, patchy sail suit that comes up to Sunny's boat. Looks like he's about to try and sell him a vacuum. Yeah, he comes up and starts landing on real thick like he's he does a fundraiser for the force there they sell off things that that are uh civil forfeitures from arrests so like obviously this is a controversial topic right now where police can arrest you they take your stuff and then they don't have to give it back to you even if you end up never being charged with a crime so what's funny about this scene is that while he's trying to make an introduction to crockett and explain this to him crockett is in the process kicking um a lady of the night with his boat <laughs> More like a one night stand um, and off his boat. She she keeps saying, uh, "Promise you'll call me," and I keep waiting for him to go. Like, like, would you just get out of here? <laughs> Sunny's in the process of cleaning both his boats out, right? And so, one of the things that you do when you clean your boat is you kick out last night's hookers. You gotta clean that place <laughs> She's up. Not first. a hooker. She's a one night stand. He's got a higher standards so- than have hookers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm offended by this. <laughs> Quickly, we find out, and we have asked numerous times, how Sonny gets all that incredible stuff. Yeah, and it turns out that what the what this fundraiser is there for, which is interesting enough, I have two points. One is with Sonny walking on those little short shorts, he is surprisingly hairless. <laughs> he has very little <laughs> hair on his body, especially the 80s. It seemed like all men from the 80s were really hairy. The other thing is that we learned that his Ferrari is not his Ferrari. It's a civil forfeiture. They had made a bust. In that bust was that car. And so that car was in lockup, basically. So he's just been driving it around as part of his cover for being Sonny Burnett, the drug mule of Miami. That's his car that he uses when he drives around. Yeah, so basically... Crockett just keeps everything that from the uh, the people have that he busts. So now it answers another question for me: Why he always kills the suspect rather than arrest them? It's easier to he doesn't want them coming bed. back. He doesn't want them coming back for their stuff. <laughs> so you know he's living in a boat that's a forfeiture. He's wearing a suit that's a forfeiture. A watch that's a forfeiture. <laughs> You know, for the record, I think the boat is actually his boat. It's the speed boat that's the forfeiture. That's a separate boat. Oh, he has two okay. different boats. The one he sleeps in, yeah, I think he actually owns that. That's like all he owns because he has no house anymore because <laughs> he's divorced. <laughs> <laughs> well, this guy, his name is Maxwell Dirks, and he's saying he's coming to get that car because they're going to auction it off. And their plan is that they're finally going to hire a force marriage counselor a little late on that one guys i mean sunny's wife has already left what's the point of having a marriage counselor now yeah his wife is long gone his son's dead we're never gonna hear from them again he's not dead okay he's just off somewhere else is he gonna come back in season four but he's gonna be like 17 uh he does come back in season three but he's he has surprisingly not aged at all he's like 10 or something it's like how much shouldn't he be so like 14 opposite. right now eventually up from behind Max- Maxwell comes Izzy Moreno. And Izzy is surprisingly pro Sunny. And wearing the most amazing outfit. Can we get that <laughs> out there? The like bright teal pants and that like triangle shirt he was wearing. <laughs> I don't know what I like better. The speech he gives uh, while he's pointing the fish at the guy or the fact that the whole time he's trying to sell Crockett his rusty Maverick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's trying to give him his rusty car. But it's got, it's got AM, FN radio in it, though. I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, uh. Eventually, Maxwell packs up his stuff and he leaves when he tries to go down to get the keys and then Elvis chases him out of the boat. He just takes off and then 
you find out that Sonny had called Izzy because he wants some information from Izzy about who killed those cops. And he says that the man you want to talk to is Orphil Rivera. He's a mid-level dealer. Izzy doesn't personally know him, but that's the name that he gives him. And then before the scene ends, you see Maxwell yell f- from the shore, like, hey, thanks for your car. And they see them towing off the Ferrari. So we can skip through the next scene real quick. It's basically just all of the cops back at the um, OTP or whatever, uh, OTB. Yeah, over at the precinct, and it's just Sonny yeah, over screaming at, at Marty. Yeah, Sonny's screaming at Marty how much he wants his car back, and then everyone, all the other cops are just making fun of him because poor Sonny lost his Ferrari, <laughs> you know? God forbid he have to drive a regular car. Or the bug van. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, I was hoping he was going to have to take the bus. <laughs> yeah. After we leave from that precinct, we go over to Orphil's house. The duo, both Tubbs and Crockett, then go check out uh, uh, Orphil Rivera based on the information they got from Izzy. And as soon as they come driving up, there's a group of men outside there washing the car. And one of them, it looks extremely familiar. It's the one of the bodyguards from the episode made for each other with the handlebar mustache and he rides the old timey bike. It's one of, it's one of those bodyguards. That's also in this episode. The mustache gives it away. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, he was wearing the same short shorts too, but. (laughs) And also no one was really washing that car. When we addressed that, they were all just kind of standing around and one guy was like lightly wiping it. (laughs) So what I like about this is that uh, I'm going to jump ahead just for a second that after, shootout that inc- that occurs Sonny tell the first thing Sonny does when Castillo shows up on scene is like start telling him like he did everything by the book I swear <laughs> so I'm thinking Sonny's walking in there seeing him washing that car that's like a Rolls Royce or something some yeah, kind of really car. nice town car and I think Sonny's going through his head like man that's a nice car I better pull out my gun <laughs> I want that car <laughs> After the shootout, I mean, you're right. He's like, they're going through the house, and Sonny's giving Marty the rundown. Like, so what did you find? He said, we found a couple keys, a blow, and some jewelry. And Tubbs is like, Santaria. <laughs> and they and Marty's like, show me. Yeah, so they go, show me now. <laughs> <laughs> so they go to the back so they can go see. And it's not a little bit of jewelry. It's the whole fucking room. It's like paper mache dolls. And they walk. I will say, though, when they walk by Zito, Zito's got a solid Jesus look going on. <laughs> yeah, the hair uh-huh. and the beard he did. <laughs> Yeah. Or yes. Mitten. And he's got the coke, so he's ready to party. <laughs> yeah, and he knows all about it. It's high grade stuff, he said. I'd like to take uh-huh. this back to the lab, <laughs> personally. It is a Santeria shine, a shrine, and Marty seems to know a lot about Santeria. Uh, he says yes. the black and white candle, which is, has symbolized vengeance and hatred. So, but this is what I don't understand, because then Marty starts spouting off about how there's no way this is the cop killer, and then something about how the candles are set up wrong, or and they're just not, not set up the same east. as the other one set them up. That's what he was saying. They're not set up as the same as the killer had them. Okay, so because he knows how the killer would have set up the candles. And so no, this because it was in the car, can't... remember? Like, yeah, because the killer set up candles in the car of the policeman. And so that's what he's saying. So it's not, it doesn't match. The setting doesn't match the two different ones. Okay, so candles are important. Yeah, apparently they symbolize all kinds of different emotions, apparently. <laughs> uh-huh. Tubbs and Crockett go running back out and they go talk to Rivera and he, at this point, because Rivera then says, he says and he ain't gonna talk to no one, especially about dirty cops. And at this point, the entire story is written. These drug members are pissed off at dirty cops. The, dirt, the two of the dirty cops got killed, but there's two more still out there. They're going to bust them at the end. The end. That's the entire story. We've got it all out in the first 10 minutes. Pretty yes. much. <laughs> <laughs> but we still have some stuff to learn about what's going on between Edward James Olmos and Eartha Kitt. They seem to have something going on here a little bit. I'm a little skeptical in this next scene. Oh, yeah. They totally have yeah. something going on. They are doing something <laughs> oh, on the no. side for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, so no joke, the next scene starts, and Eartha Kitt's coming downstairs, and I'm like, did they just stop off to get a massage? <laughs> <laughs> and all, so her name in this episode is Chata, and basically all that happens in the scene is that she confirms with the duo and Marty basically what we just said, that that Santero, she, she refers to him as the Sa- Santero, he's mad about something, it's probably the dirty cops they're out for revenge that's what all this setup means and then the duo leaves and and marty stays behind and they see and when he stays behind they seem to know each other really well yeah she talks about how yeah, she's so worried about the much, expression 
pretty much. He's coming downstairs. The lieutenant lets the boys know, hey, you know, this is where I come get my chakra fixed. Um, <laughs> Crockett makes a skeptical comment, and the lieutenant goes and sadly walks over towards the uh, window, uh, you know, like, that th- That hurts Crockett. <laughs> They go through the whole spiel. There's this whole scene that goes through. And basically, what Miss Cleo says is that you're looking for a crazy person. <laughs> basically. <laughs> you would so think, it was, based on Tubbs' future p- p- profession, that him and Chata would have more in common than Marty and Chata. You know, because Tubbs tried to sell this type of information on the TV. So... <laughs> Uh, okay, that was before. He didn't know he was going to have to sell this kind of information on the TV. This is what drove him to it. Uh, at this point in the episode, to get back to that, I have a sneaking suspicion that this episode is going, or at least it is or what I put in my notes, was that this episode is going to end with Lieutenant Marty having a magic battle with the murderer. <laughs> magic. <laughs> with candles. He's going to have a candle battle. Well, we've already seen Marty knows the... Uh, Death touch. <laughs> so, you know, it wouldn't sometimes. surprise me. It wouldn't surprise me that he's a master of the black art, you know? <laughs> well, you, we already concluded, John, that he is the Highlander, and he's also <laughs> Kung Fu, so... <laughs> yes. I will say, guys, that Eartha Kitt is my Catwoman, not Michelle Pfeiffer, not Halle Berry. Eartha Kitt is my Catwoman. Uh, what about Julie Newmar? Mm. Oh, that's a tough one. Oh, uh, I forgot that about her. Is Catwoman, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when we leave from Catwoman's house and we go over to the auction house, Izzy is there and he's dis- <laughs> he is disguised himself <laughs> as Count Moreno. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he has told it- Max that he owns the marina that Sonny has his boat parked at and that Max is like I didn't realize you were so rich and Izzy's like oh it's okay it's of course it's I'm such a millionaire you should not worry about it <laughs> I have to keep it a secret otherwise everybody would bother me if they knew I was the count <laughs> which why would there be a count of the marina he's the count of the marina <laughs> What's funny is that he has successfully talked this guy out of Carl's Ferrari. Like, he's getting ready to just hand Izzy the keys. Yeah, he's saying he's supposed to go for a test drive. Yeah, I will say, uh, he says, though, I have a quote here, though, one of the things that he says. He's like, because Max asks him, like, I didn't, you seem like you're so normal. And he says, quote, proud of my ability to circulate among the common mangs. Yeah. <laughs> Even his mangs, too. <laughs> Once again, Izzy Moreno proving that he is the greatest <laughs> actor of all time. That's on his Wikipedia page. <laughs> that points to how he's going to account. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, right when Max is is gonna give Izzy the keys, he's like, "I want to test drive the car before before I buy it from you." Crockett busts in and just pushes Count Moreno around and yells at Max, and then pushes Izzy outside. And he says, when he gets him outside, he's like, "He's like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> I can't handle it. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Why would you do something like that? Are you out of your patootie?" <laughs> <laughs> So let me get this straight. He said, are you out of your ass? Yeah. Are you out of your ass? <laughs> First of all, he's supposed to be a drug dealer and he says, like, what if that slips into his regular job? Like, I got you so now. I want to point-, <laughs> point out that at this time, the way the camera is shot, you have Crockett looking at Izzy. And in between them, there is a guy in very light blue, blue jeans just standing, staring at the two of them during this whole altercation in which Crockett finally turns and tells him to basically F off. So <laughs> at first, I, I w- at first I was like, who the hell is this guy with the blue jeans? Was he just walking by while they were filming? Uh, um, you <laughs> know, like what's the story? The <laughs> so it turns out this is Manny. Manny is Izzy Moreno's sidekick. Manny doesn't talk in any of his appearances, and he's in like six or seven episodes as Izzy Moreno's sidekick. But I've realized through extensive Googling, you cannot find who actually played Manny in the show because he doesn't talk, and so he doesn't get a credit. And so there's just this mystery guy who was in like seven episodes of Miami Vice in like multiple scenes that just nobody knows. You know, and it makes sense that, like, 
he doesn't get a credit because he doesn't actually say anything. But it's also like it's this total mystery. The, the man doesn't actually exist. What's Maybe weird to me thing. is that it, nope is that the internet usually you know the, they will they'll tell you what the dog's name uh, what the dog's name was who the real dog was in like Air Bud the movie. You know? <laughs> Like you can find that information John about for all that. kinds of. <laughs> John was in there looking for Airbud's name. What was his real name? Was it Fido? <laughs> was he a good boy? <laughs> we'll never know. <laughs> yes, he was a good boy, and I think his name was something like Jeff. It was actually like a regular name. <laughs> Jeffrey, get it straight. No, oh. Informal. <laughs> but uh, the, the internet normally has those random type of facts. You know, I am surprised that no one has been able to answer the question. Who was Manny? To the point where, like, even the in Wikipedia Miami Vice page lists him as unknown. And I <laughs> found multiple times where people have asked the question, but no one has an answer. Like, at no point in time has it turned up like, oh, it was Bob. He's an accountant now. You know, it seems like that's a right role for someone that's like, oh, yeah, no, that was James Franco's first role was he was standing next to the car and drove Izzy around or Count Moreno around. <laughs> Count, get it straight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so if someone out there knows who Manny was, please let me know. <laughs> Killing Don't, John. Wasted like twenty. <laughs> I wasted like like almost a half hour looking for that guy. <laughs> Just to wrap up this scene, Sonny obviously thought that Izzy was going to steal the car, which obviously Izzy was going to steal it. Izzy says he was going to bring it back to Sonny with new numbers and a new paint job and everything. Like, who knows how Izzy was going to ever going to do that. So who knows what was actually going to happen with the car. But they do find out before they leave is that the car is almost beyond repair at this point, though. They've left it outside, uncovered. It rained. Like, the paint's already rusting off of it. It's got bird shit all over it. There's kittens living in it. Chaos happening at this impound lot. You act like kittens living so in it is think- a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you think Crockett does with the kittens? Are the kittens his new pet, or are they food for Elvis? <laughs> I think he leaves them at the, at the impound lot. <laughs> like a big meanie. I think we didn't see them. the kittens again for the rest of the episode. <laughs> yeah, I know. What is the deal with that? I need to know what happened to these kittens. They're two girls. You I don't think you want to know. <laughs> yeah, I'm no, just saying. I don't, I don't think know. you want to know. They were like There's a happy gator. <laughs> Who's been a good gator? <laughs> <laughs> We have a brief stop over of uh, Tubbs doing some office work before we head out to like another really odd scene. But we have this stop hey, over where Tubbs is able to. Quick question. Quick question. Do you think the nerdy guy Ferris Bueller Crockett's Ferrari? Do you think <laughs> that's what happened? Oh, good point. Good point. That's why it's all messed up. <laughs> totally took it out for a joy ride. Yeah, yeah. It's got a thousand more miles on it. Some quote unquote love stains. Ew, gross. <laughs> I can't get anybody. He, he's the one that needs a hooker. Hey, maybe in a Ferrari he can. Maybe. Actually, maybe he got Crockett's girl in that Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> That we have that brief stopover where Tubbs is doing some some actual office work. He's doing something that Marty told him to do. They're going to go run the credit check on the two dead police officers. And they find out that they've been maxing out their credit cards and then paying them off in full every single month. So the question is, like, how are they getting this money? They've been doing this for five or six months now. So they're, they're, they're starting to put together more the broader picture of how dirty these cops are when we leave from there we go down to the beach down to south beach and there's a couple guys they're just cruising in their porsche along the waterfront there's like trying to pick up girls as they drive by i guess and this scene is really strange because there's these other two cops that are following them no one's done anything wrong i i I think the cops hold them over for being creepy, and when they ask them, and the cops are nervous because they just had two of their own killed, so they've got their shotguns out, because that's what you do when you pull someone over for being creepy. Yeah, you pull out your shotgun. And just by chance, instead of a license, the guy had the guy has an Uzi. <laughs> By so chance. they waste them. Yeah, and she they... turns out to be a justified shooting. Like I, I don't I, know. I'm... That was a weird thing. Is it justified or not? Like because they stopped them for no reason. Like, they yeah. wouldn't have stopped them. It's a, yeah. That was a weird one. It is. So it's like it's like the cops are nervous, but so are the criminals because that's why they pulled the gun out. They they saw the cops walking up with the shotgun, and it's like so. Who's at fault here? Who's the one? Is it because the criminals pulled know. their gun out? Is it because the cops were so on edge that they just started firing right away? Like. Yeah, but they had no reason it, to pull them over. All, 
So mm -hmm. why did they pull him over in the first place? The cops were just looking for a reason because they had that car because they were wearing those suits and being creepy. I mean, they said like, oh, we have nothing on him. But no, well, there's got to be something in that car. <laughs> well, maybe it was just, you know, a misunderstanding and the guy shouldn't keep his Uzi where he keeps his license. <laughs> True. I mean, that, you could get confused. You fit your Uzi in your pocket where your license should be. So The other confusing thing with this scene is that it has no bearing on anything else that happens in the rest of the episode. This is like a standalone incident. Well, I think what they're trying to say with that is because uh, Martin keeps saying like all through it that he wants to diffuse the situation before things get too crazy between the cops and the drug dealers and like regular people on the streets. So I think they're trying to show like this is what happens when that goes on. But the people are paranoid. The cops are paranoid. The, the drug dealers are paranoid. Everyone's paranoid because these cops got killed. I, I don't know. Maybe they were just trying to do like a really like serious scene right before they went to intermission. Maybe. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Because after this we go to intermission, you know, you know, they have the band come out, you know, the guest host, you know, thank you, everybody. <laughs> now back to Vice. <laughs> we we see a driving scene where Tubbs says he just tells Crockett what he found out. And he's, they said, there's always more dirty cops. If you found some, there's always more. And Crockett says he knows where to go looking. So they go to a bar and this bar is clearly like the cop hangout, right? This is the place where, where co all the cops in South Beach go to hang out. Um, and everyone recognizes Sonny right away. Like he's some rock star as soon as he walks in there. He goes there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and you're right, John. The band comes out. The band starts playing. They're playing a cover song. And then uh, a Donnie Brook breaks out. Well, everywhere you go, it breaks out with Crockett. Because he was on a mission <laughs> to go start a fight. That's what he went there for. He was exactly. mad. And he was like, well, he, Tubbs went to go dance. And he was like, I'm going to go get to the bottom of this by myself without you. Yeah, he goes so, over to those. So basically, those. basically, when police work fails, you can always just go beat them up at a bar. <laughs> That is part of his police work, clearly. <laughs> Beat them up. <laughs> yeah, see, they, he goes over there. And t he basically comes over there, tells them, those cops are crooked, and I think you are too. And the, uh, one of the cops says, them's fighting words. And then <laughs> it breaks out into a brawl. <laughs> those dirty, dirty, dirty cops. <laughs> And so after the fight is bro broken up, Tubbs and Crockett leave, and then we have a brief scene where we see inside of the bar between these cops. They say, Crockett needs to back off, or we're going to make him back off. That's the extent of that conversation. So we just get confirmation in the episode that they're dirty by actually showing them talking about being dirty. And then this is where the episode starts to get really confusing. Because the next scene we have is we... So if we go to Miranda's boat, this character has not been introduced. We have no idea what's happening here we have no idea why he's here the scene makes zero sense we have miranda's on there with his guys and this other gentleman named davio who's really upset on miranda saying that the cops are busting him they kidnapped his kid and miranda says like hey that's just part of the deal this that's part of our work and then Davio says he's just out to get revenge in this end of the scene. At no point in time, do we, as a viewers, if you've never seen this episode, which Melissa, while we were watching it together, she gave away like who, not say gave away, but just said who who it was. But as a first time viewer, I'm like, what the fuck's going on here? Who are these people? Uh, why are we here? I listen, I thought it was obvious that you could figure it out. That's why I was like, oh, <laughs> so then you didn't get that. So sorry about that. <laughs> I thought it was pretty obvious about what was going on in this boat. <laughs> and then when I gave it away, I was like, oh, well, okay. So that, that happens. Yeah, that's what happens there. <laughs> I'm still confused. <laughs> when we leave from Morandis's boat, we have a quick stop over at Chata's house. Just Marty's there. And this is when of we Of course, get just Marty. <laughs> Marty is feeling a disturbance in the force. <laughs> <laughs> He's having a moment. <laughs> He's His there. His way is too much to the left. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we get. We finally get confirmation. This scene should have happened before the Miranda's boat scene because Chada tells him, "Hey, this guy named Miranda's wants to meet with you." <laughs> like, oh, that would have been better to fill that part in. Like, thank oh. you, Miss Cleo. <laughs> Now I get why I pay you two ninety nine a minute. <laughs> She's still telling Marty that's a bad decision to meet with him, but that we just get confirmation. Now we know who the hell Miranda's is. So after after Marty is done seeing Yoda after feeling a disturbance in the force, and he doesn't finish his training. He just finds out that he's supposed to go talk to this person named Miranda's. We go to the Ultramont Mall. 
and Tubbs is out. He's doing some shopping. He's checking talking out to the ladies. Him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't spend too much time on this scene. He just he gets in his car and he starts driving, and the police follow him. Now Tubbs and the police know. He is actively investigating dirty police officers. So if they're tailing him in their police car, do they think it was going to be a secret? I mean, it's pretty obvious when a police car is following you, right? Yeah, it's not like they were undercover in their secret car or something. (laughs) Well, this is a great, it is a great scene because we get a little bit of a montage. So we get this great montage of like tailing or following montage. So there's Tubbs is listening to his mixtape and their fire mixtape. (laughs) The police are following him around and then it ends with him. Pulling over, getting out of his car, and telling the cops they're a bunch of chumps as they drive by. <laughs> this isn't your neighborhood. <laughs> you're out of your league. You're out of everywhere. Just get out of here. <laughs> so then if I'm I'm right, we jump over to the scene where, where Marty is finally going to have mortal combat with the murderer. <laughs> In his white outfit. <laughs> His white dress shirt opened up with his white shoes and his white pants. I'm pretty sure whoever wins this battle is going to have to eat the other's heart. I think that's how this works. <laughs> that's Kalima. the only way to solve it. Kalima. <laughs> Son Korea. <laughs> Well, I just, I felt like they were at like a zoo or something. It kind of looked like a, like a kid's TV show, like that shows is a boomafoo. It kind of looked like that. Like there's some lemurs hopping around. Maybe a couple of guys are out there. These, they're called the, the, the crap brothers. They teach them all about, you know, these different animals that live all over the world. But instead we get this I long. Just want, I just want to point out that Crockett and Tubbs are the ones who are supposed to be investigating this. Their lieutenant has just gone off on his own to chase his own mystical battle. <laughs> <laughs> while the investigation or the actual investigation is going on <laughs> and then there's this long pause where he's just standing there he's got his white he's in all white white shoes white pants white shirt pants hiked all the way up to his armpits and he's just standing there and there's this chair that's on fire and there's like it's like there for 30 seconds to a minute almost like the director was trying to tell us something like there's some it some imagery or some undertones that they were trying to convey to us. And I don't understand. What the fuck's going on? Lieutenant, I'll explain it to you, Dominic. The yeah. lieutenant has to, he goes, he has to go into this cave. And then <laughs> on every level of the cave, he has to fight a guy, Kung Fu style. <laughs> By about the fourth level, he's going to have to fight Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. <laughs> <laughs> and then once he does, he will fight the last guy to win the tournament. <laughs> Spoiler alert, the last guy is Bruce Lee. Or it could be that he thinks he's the greatest ever and he shows up and he ends up having to fight a final battle with someone who can do the splits really well and will win even while blinded from the dust he throws from his crotch. Hey, he did not stand a chance against Jean-Claude Van Damme. He would not. I don't care if he has a white suit or not. Right now, people are very confused. We've gone off now. <laughs> So after all this, Tubbs, I mean not Tubbs, but Marty finally gets a chance to go talk to Morandes. But when he gets there, he's in his black suit with his pencil thin tie. He's not dressed in any of the all white. Who knows what he was doing in the previous scene. We just jumped to where he's standing on the balcony talking to Morandes and he's in his normal suit. Maybe that was his zoo suit. That's when he goes to see <laughs> that- the zoo animals. <laughs> See, see, no, in that last scene, he was in the Matrix. (laughs) (laughs) Now he's he's back out of the Matrix. He's going to talk to him because he knows what he did. (laughs) We find out here that for the last six months, there's these South Beach detectives that have been making trouble. But Davio, he wouldn't pay to play. You know, he wouldn't be bribing these cops. So the cops beat him up in front of his wife and then kidnapped his son and then finally gave him back his son after he paid $100,000. Marty... After, upon hearing this, is pissed. Super pissed. Yeah, he's really mad about the way they're treating those drug dealers. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do it about that way. <laughs> somewhere around this point in which the episode was wrapped up in my mind. So I started chasing down who is Izzy Moreno's sidekick Manny. <laughs> and I started chasing down the rabbit hole at this point in the episode. <laughs> 
But the and we're almost done, right? We only have just a few minutes left to happen in this episode. Marty leaves and he just tells Miranda that he's going to go do what Miranda has always been afraid to do. And he's going to come back to bury Miranda. So whatever that means, I guess we'll find out in the future. Maybe what's going to happen with Miranda? I'm pretty sure Miranda like makes another. Uh, he makes another appearance in his like, mm. episode too. I think I might be wrong. Oh, he might bring him back as a different person or something. But that guy does come back. So they they might actually patch up this that storyline. Interesting. No, they'll probably just create a okay, new one. I was... <laughs> <laughs> so we have a brief stop over at the precinct where the vice team is just, they're, they're going to go down. They're going to, they find out they're going to go bring down Davio. IA, Internal Affairs, is going to go take care of the dirty cops. And as they, the only thing we get that's, I think that's, that's important other than this bust is that Marty tells Crockett, like, hey, and I've fixed your car problem. So then we have a, it, it, it like kind of quick fire. So when we see one of the dirty cops, he goes over to see his buddy, his uh, his buddy dirty cop, and he walks into his house and he sees that Davio has killed his partner and his wife, tied him up together and killed them both right there. So he's he just yells revenge and then runs out to his Bronco. <laughs> So he runs out to his Bronco and takes off, but that's perfect timing because that means that both the Dirty Cop and Davio are going to be at the same place at the same time. So we can patch both these storylines up in the same place. It's just a coincidence. It's not, <laughs> not the story written that way. <laughs> so we go over to the Davio bust and the vice team are placed like normal. They're posing as utility workers. There's a funny little scene where grandma is taking pictures of the duo sitting around. She accused them of being lazy, even though her, her energy bill is really expensive. And of course, they're all stationed around the ruin it comes a Miami police officer, although he's a dirty police officer in this episode, but we just like to stick with our trend that the Miami PD normally come and fuck everything up whenever they're involved. He comes flying mm-hmm. in in his Bronco and then just like rolls it into Davio's front yard. So I don't know what any of that had to do with how he was going to get revenge. He basically killed himself on his front lawn. And of course, it spawns yeah. a shootout between the vice team and Davio's guys. Now, and now Crockett also has her Rolls Royce. <laughs> he's racking up the cars. <laughs> he's racking them up. Is he's rusted car or the Rolls Royce? He's got so many cars now. In the in the short shootout, we see that Crockett shoots and kills Davio. So now again. No witnesses. The Miami Vice team have killed everyone who's involved in this. Well, I guess except for Miranda's. He, he gets away. And then they get the cop bloodily stumbles out of the wrecked Bronco. And then the duo sees that he's got one of those Santeria trinkets in his hand. And you can see they put together in their head like, oh, and his partner must be dead. So everything's done. Everyone's dead except for this one cop, essentially. Pretty much. So then we end this. The, we end the episode on a very... In a very odd way, right? The B team shows up in the bug van. Count Moreno was there with his chauffeur. Yeah. <laughs> and for some reason, Sonny is in the, the car. Mysterious Manny. <laughs> yeah. And Manny's like, he's trying to open the door and he can't get the door open. And then Izzy gets out on the other side. And then Sonny gets out of Izzy's car. So I'm already really confused. Like the B team's there in the bug van. Tubbs is there in his own car. Sonny gets out of Izzy's car. I don't know what the hell is going on here. And then it. I don't know. I, I almost expected someone to tell a bad joke and then everyone start laughing and then freeze for <laughs> the end shot. credits. That's like every 80s show ended that way. And then basically Izzy and Sonny just railroad the Max, Max Dirks. They just railroad him to get him to sign over his car. But the forms are falsified because Marty's already taken care of the car. So none of this had to do with anything either. Yeah, but can we also address no. that this guy Max was dirty, right? Like he was willing to just take the money from mm-hmm. Izzy and not even try to auction off. Like it was basically like taking a bribe. Like, yeah, no, I'll totally take your money and I won't really auction off the car like I was supposed to do. <laughs> Like, what was he well, at least money? he got to take it for really a joy give... ride. Yeah, I know. Was he really going to give the money to the department, or he was just going to? Yeah, that could be. That could be. That's a uh, that's a whole nother episode. That's why the point. Yeah, I, I guess the moral of the story is don't trust people with glasses <laughs> or weird patchy suits. What was with the suit? It was like, like like he had a bunch of wet spots on it or something. <laughs> Very strange. Uh-huh. And that concludes this episode. It was it was fun when the fun stuff was happening, but there's a lot of potholes in here that made it kind of confusing. So let's go uh, let's go over to the music segment and talk about the music that's in this in this episode before we give our fi- our final thoughts. All right, John. I yo know, I only remember a couple songs in this. I remember the cover song of a T Rex song that was playing in the bar, but uh, 
Tell me what you got in music. All right. So we're going to start off with Sharp Dressed Man by ZZ Top. 83 album, Eliminator. Now, I've already covered them a few times in this music section. So I'm going to talk about something more specific to the song itself. The video for Sharp Dressed Man featured dancer and model Peter Tram basically leaving a nightclub job frustrated He meets ZZ Top and a bunch of women in ZZ Top's famous red car, becomes cool, drives around with them, goes back to the club, shows off how cool he is. I bring this up because Peter Tram wasn't just in one ZZ Top music video. He was in a couple. He was also in Gimme All Your Lovin'. So, but do you know what else Peter Tram is famous for? Uh, I'm guess if it has something to do with my advice, it has some way to tie with Peter Gabriel. Actually, no, it's... Closer to that actually ties with Kevin Bacon. In <laughs> that Peter Tram was the dance double for Kevin Bacon in the movie Footloose. <laughs> oh, weird. Peter Tram also starred in a couple movies called Staying Alive, where he, where he played a character, Dancer. Can't Stop the Music, where he played another character, also called Dancer. And he is also married to, and I'm not making this up, Marine Ja. Jahan, the famously uncredited stunt dancer for Jennifer Beale in the movie Flashdance. Oh, man. So it's a whole couple just constantly getting slighted at their dancing abilities. Yes. The two most famous dance scene movies, uh, dance scenes in movies, Mm -hmm. um, they were in, and they're not famous for it, and they're married. So (laughs) that's who Peter Tram. So a little insight into uh, Peter Tram, who appeared in the music videos, ZZ Top videos, Sharp Dressed Man, and Give Me All Your Lovin'. So now we move on to Vice, song by Grandmaster Melly Mel. Mm. So he was born Melvin Glover. He's an East Coast rapper and the lead rapper and songwriter of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Mm, Classic. He's Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame so much that they credit him with coming up with the term hip-hop. Damn. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's like... Yes. (laughs) Father of hip-hop. They say that he created... Say he created the term term hip hop while making light of a friend who had just joined the army. He he sang together in a rap at, at one point, saying hip hop, hip hop, and something else I didn't write down. <laughs> um, we'll just follow that. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, something that rhymes with hip hop. After breaking out with their hit, the message, the group actually released an anti-drug track called "White Lines Don't Do It." This song had an unofficial music video made for, featuring Lawrence Fis- Fishburne before he had ever gotten an acting credit. Man, and was- more, the more you learn about Lawrence Fishburne, the more you, more you realize he will do literally anything. He will appear in yes. anything. And it was directed by a then unknown film student named Spike Lee. Oh, wow. wow. That's like the who's who. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Let's just say there's a there's a number of other facts, including something about Grandmaster Melly Mel appearing in a song with Lady Gaga before anyone knew who she was. Jump to the end to what he's doing now. Well, of course... In 2006, Mel would go to wrestling school so that he could try and get a contract with the WWE. <laughs> Gotta get all, so John. He is, Gotta get them all. And so now he is currently working on an Urban Re- Wrestling Federation League. <laughs> perfect. And yes, that yeah, which is perfect. So now we get to Bang a Gong, Get It On, the T-Rex song, originally re- released by T-Rex in 1971 off their album Electric Warrior. Mm, that's later than I thought. Aside from it being a great song by a great band, let's get to the crappy band that covered it. <laughs> the crappy band is known as The Power Station. So in a minute, Melissa's going to get very angry at me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm listening. So The Power Station is an 80s supergroup made up of the members of Duran Duran and singer Robert Palmer. Ah. I, yeah, I thought the guy on the guitar sounded familiar. <laughs> Basically, Duran Duran was on tour in 1983 with Robert Palmer and band members John and Andy Taylor 
Taylor and Tony Thompson of Duran Duran were so impressed by Robert Palmer, they decided to do a side project together. So they got together a little later in 83 after recording Duran Duran's third album. They got together to do a just to simply do a cover of the T-Rex song. So they ended up doing an entire album together. That sounds an awful John lot and- like we were just going out to dinner. Then before we know it, we had sex. Like, <laughs> yes. it's like We just got, so, got together to do one song. Next thing you know, we're, we're, we're releasing an album. So and, and a little background, too. Robert Palmer had already had a little bit of a solo career himself. He kind of fizzled. His career kind of fizzled out to the point where he was opening for Duran Duran. Members of Duran Duran wanted to do the side project because they wanted to do something more Led Zeppelin-like. Okay? Hmm. So hmm. That's they recorded path. the album. They recorded the album and got a little bit of hype to him. People got excited. And Robert Palmer decides, I'm going to revive my solo career and starts missing concerts and venues <laughs> and records his solo album. Wow. And so they, the, the band decides to bring in Michael Des Bears, B-A-R-R-E-S. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. Sounds good to me. Yeah, Michael Bears. To replace them. And using Michael Pear Des Bears' friendship with Don Johnson, they get an appearance on Miami Vice singing Get It On, their cover of T-Rex. Wow. And they would also, <laughs> using using the same lead singer's friendship with Joel Silvers, would make a song for the movie Commando as well. They would go on, John and An- An- Andy Taylor and Tully Thompson would go back to Duran Duran. Robert Palmer would release his two biggest songs in Addicted to Love and Simply Irresistible, and everybody would live happily ever after. Yeah, I guess, I guess it all worked out. Everything's good. <laughs> I mean, Robert Palmer's so, kind of a dick. But, I mean, it all worked yes. out. <laughs> yeah, they, and Duran Duran kind of took advantage of Michael Des Bears. <laughs> we only want you to come in and take over the lead singing long enough for us to get an appearance on Miami Vice and do a, com- <laughs> a song for the movie Commando. <laughs> it's and then such we're an call. odd combination to be in the movie Commando. <laughs> I know, I know. (laughs) So that brings us to our last song, Dark Night by the Blasters. This is where it gets kind of fun. So the rock band The Blasters was formed by brothers Phil and Dave Alvin, with bassist John Bass and drummer Bill Bateman. They're kind of a hard rock, punk rock band with with a big blues influence basically and they had a really big cult following but they never made it mainstream so you know they're one of those bands that like that the other bands talk about like uh henry rollins talked about how much he liked them Mm. and because black flag toured with them a few times so but they really never made it outside of doing a few songs for a couple movies they did a song for ridley scott's someone to watch over me they did a song for bull durham the, this song, Dark Night, also appeared in the movie Dusk Till Dawn. But what is extremely interesting to me about this band is that it, Dave Alvin would step away as lead singer in 1986 and be replaced with a man named Hollywood Fats. <laughs> <laughs> Hollywood Fats, real person, by the way. Hollywood Fats, real person. His real name is Michael Leonard Mann. Huh. Wait a minute. Not to be confused with Michael Kenneth Mann of Vice fame. Oh. Oh, See, different middle names. Different (laughs) middle names. If you want to read something interesting, read Hollywood Fats Wikipedia. Because he's the definition of a rock star. This is a guy who was invited by Muddy Waters to play with him. Mm -hmm. This is a guy who has all of these done all these crazy things in the blues world, in blues and rock world, under the name Hollywood Fats. And in 1986, he would join the Blasters to replace Dave Alvin and then die of an over, of a heroin overdose in L.A. later that same year. Wow. So, so let me get straight. He's a legend. They're able to convince a legend to come to their band. They're, they have instant credibility for being a, a, an amazing musician's favorite band. And then within a few months have to go crawling back to their original lead singer like, look, we didn't mean it. I mean, yep. yeah. <laughs> yes. We were on a break. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And mind you, the one of the few things the Blasters are known for is their song Dark Knight making it into a 
Michael Mann Miami Vice episode, but mm -hmm. not Michael Leonard Mann, <laughs> not Hollywood Fats. <laughs> yeah, dude, check out his Wikipedia. It is awesome. I, I am jealous. That man alive. <laughs> well, I mean, every week, John, I'm just blown away by the music, especially when we have someone named Hollywood Fats that makes an appearance <laughs> in, a real in the name. episode. <laughs> Yes. Not Especially only is that a real name, but I was able to connect him to the show. <laughs> uh, actually, for a minute there, when I was reading his Wikipedia and I first learned his name was Michael Mann, I thought that it was like a parody, like Michael Mann had stolen his Wikipedia. <laughs> um, you know, or like Michael Mann, the showrunner, actually was filling in for the band and just created this <laughs> Hollywood fats persona. Because Mike, no, Michael Mann can guy. do literally anything. Yes. Yeah. But no, no, no. <laughs> Hollywood fats. Real guy. <laughs> well, let's get over and uh, discuss our final thoughts and wrap this episode up. All right, Melissa, how about you kick us off this week? <laughs> Why do you your... always got to be making me kick it off? <laughs> <laughs> what are your final <laughs> thoughts on this episode? Uh, I really like this episode. It's like if you guys have talked about earlier, it's got a good mix of the fun and the serious. I don't, I have to say, I don't really like the episodes with like the Santeria or the voodoo stuff in it, but this is the better of them. I like Eartha Kitt. That's a good guest star for me. Other than the fact that you get to see Marty in a different outfit, that was, <laughs> that was huge. I had just talked about how he never wears nothing but his suits and then all of a sudden he was in this white glorious outfit. So that was a highlight for me. <laughs> and Don Johnson wearing his underwear, which clearly his underwear. Those were not shorts. <laughs> I just want to reiterate that. It's underwear, not shorts. And yes, he is very hairless too. So that was that was a shining moment in this episode for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say the Izzy stuff and the car and the Ferrari stuff was was fun, and that's what that's one of the things I love about Miami Vice is that it doesn't take itself so seriously that it has some segments in there that are just for fun, just to, just on purpose to make you laugh. It's another episode where we have a great guest star in Eartha Kit, which I know there's Julie Newmar, but it's I think Eartha Kit is my Catwoman. Just saying, <laughs> um, but the. You know, in general, I the, heart the shell Pfeiffer. So, <laughs> you know. in general, this is a really good episode. The only thing that threw me off was the whole Miranda's thing at the end, where we have no introduction to who this person is, and all of a sudden, surprise! Here's the person who's actually behind all this. So, and we at we just abandon the the police story about halfway through and switch over to the Miranda's. So, in general, I really liked the episode. I just didn't expect how how this thing was going to turn at the end. It was. I guess it's nice to say that it's that we figured out what the storyline was in the first 10 minutes. So <laughs> that's one way to put it. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? I really enjoyed the uh, whole Ferrari Crockett and Mer Izzy stuff. You know, I mean, I enjoyed it so much that they could have almost gotten rid of the dirty whole dirty cop storyline. And I'd have been okay with it because we've done Dirty Cops plenty before. I'm more interested in the Ferrari and Count Moreno. <laughs> so I will say that the more we learn about Marty, the weirder he is. You know, at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if he's some kind of weird vegan um, <laughs> hipster type, like... Like, you don't know. You just don't know. And so uh, I, I'm just, I'm always interested when we learn about Marty and I want to see him go, go take on, on Kareem Abdul Jabbar and, <laughs> you know, more of the Kung Fu Marty. That's the Marty I want to, that's the Marty I want to see. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Again, we will not be recording an episode next week. We're going to skip because of the holiday that's coming up on this upcoming episode or this upcoming weekend we hope you enjoyed this episode and we hope that you subscribe you can check us out on our normal rss feed or on youtube stitcher you can pretty much find us anywhere you find podcasts and anywhere that you find video be sure to check out our website go with the heat.com we'd love to hear from you get us on our twitter or facebook go with the heat or you can email us go with the heat at gmail.com we'll be back in two weeks with a brand new episode until then we'll see you next time happy kwanzaa <laughs> bye guys <laughs> 